and welcome to another episode of Keeping London Healthy. My name is Dr. Mario Iwaya. Uh, as we approach summer, I thought it'd be a good idea for us to kind of take stock of some issues that I know arise for a lot of you uh, come summer months and a lot of things that we see in uh, both family docs offices and in the merge that seem to be bringing people in. So I've decided we're going to take today's episode to deal with a lot of these uh, issues around safety and keeping you healthy. Uh, to give you some advice coming into the summer months. Uh, we're also going to be talking a bit about COVID. There's some updates on keeping you safe around that. Uh, so we'll be back right after this message uh, for some of those COVID updates. Welcome back. So we're going to spend the first half of today's episode uh, doing some review about some topics around COVID. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't talked about COVID for uh, a few episodes now, um, and things have been fairly uh, stable in terms of the hospital situation uh, with COVID, but obviously we're seeing still a lot of COVID in the community. Uh, most of you, I, I would hope by, by now, all of you probably know at least a few people who've developed COVID. Um, so certainly we're not through this in terms of not seeing any COVID, we're seeing lots of it. So there's a few things that we want to go over today, um, just to, to uh, kind of keep you up to speed with, uh, with some uh, latest stuff. So first we'll talk about um, boosters. This is a question I get uh, quite commonly, who, who should have a booster, uh, who needs one? So for anyone who's had uh, the first series of, of their vaccine, so um, for those who aren't immunocompromised, the primary series would have been your first two doses. For someone who is immunocompromised, the primary series would have been uh, your, your three doses. So for anyone who's had that primary series, it is recommended uh, that you have a booster dose. And the reason for that is it's pretty, pretty clear cut uh, at this point that those who had a booster dose do better in terms of reducing hospitalization and even reducing uh, likelihood of getting COVID compared to those who haven't had a booster. The primary series is the most important series to get. So that, that's where you see your biggest drop in these risks, but that that booster dose, so again, either your third dose for most of us or fourth dose for immunocompromised, does uh, reliably reduce that risk uh, even further. Doesn't eliminate the risk entirely. You know, many of you know people who've had their booster dose and still have had COVID, but it reduces that risk. So who? So when do you get the booster dose? So anyone 18 and over who's had their primary series are eligible for a booster dose three months or later beyond. Uh, that's that um, them, them completing their primary series. So if someone's had two doses, they're eligible for that third dose three months after that second dose. Um, for anyone um, 12 to 17 years of age, they can get their booster dose six months after that, um, after the completion of their primary series. So again, booster doses, the, that, at the first booster dose, there's really no controversy around the fact that it is important to get and does reduce your risk. We know, again, even, you know, we look at the hospitalizations, um, we know disproportionately, certainly the completely unvaccinated are by far the highest risk, but we know those who've had uh, only their primary series are still higher risk for hospitalization than those who have the booster dose. So bottom line, if you haven't had your booster dose, get it. Now, what about the second booster dose? Because some people are eligible for the second booster dose now. If you are 60 years of age or higher, or your uh, First Nations Inuit um, uh, uh, Métis descent, um, you are eligible for your for your second booster dose once five months have elapsed have elapsed since your first booster dose. So the question is, well, do we need the second booster? You know, isn't this get, getting a little bit of overkill with these doses? And 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 the, and, and the fact is that for those who are high risk, and again, anyone sixty plus, I would I would uh, label as high risk. Um, we know that the second booster dose. It looks like in the early data provides additional benefit over the first booster dose. How much? Well, not as much of a benefit as the fir first booster dose compared to the primary series, but still it, there's there's some additional benefit to that second booster dose. And in and in populations that are high risk, again, and and seniors would 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 classify that second booster dose brings that uh, brings that risk down, and any reduction in risk is going to be important. Now, what about everyone else? Are we going to need second booster doses down the road? We don't know, right? And we're going to have to wait for data to come out through the summer, through the fall, to see does that does that affect, or again, people like myself who have you know um, average risk, and I've had I've had three doses. Um, 
is there going to be benefit to that fourth fourth dose for for average risk populations? We're going to have to see uh, kind of what happens over the next uh, few months. But at the very least, again, if you're 60 years of age or over, and it's been five months since the last dose you got, please, please go ahead and get that that booster shot, that second booster. Okay. I know a lot of talk about boosters. I know it's quite confusing, but hopefully that cleared things up a little bit. Uh, second thing to chat about is going to be uh, testing for COVID. It's not as hard now, I don't think, for most of you to get rapid tests compared to how it was a few months ago. So again, if you have symptoms, uh, please go ahead, uh, do a rapid test. Uh, if it's negative, you may want to repeat it a few days later. Um, and, and again, rationale for that is if you have COVID, obviously we want to be, be isolating uh, five days from symptom onset uh, like we have during this, uh, during this time. If you're eligible for Paxlovid, which we'll talk about in a second, if you're eligible for Paxlovid and you're negative on a rapid test, you should still be getting a PCR because you could have COVID with a negative rapid test. Uh, a positive rapid test means you have COVID for sure. There's no, there's no false positives when it comes to the rapid test. But if you're negative on a rapid test, doesn't mean you don't have COVID, it's still possible. So again, if, they're, if you're eligible for Paxlovid, the antiviral, and you have a negative rapid test, you should be getting a PCR to rule out COVID. Okay, so now let's let's talk about Paxlovid. What's, what is Paxlovid? Paxlovid is uh, it's an antiviral medication that's now available, um, and it's available here, on, here in Ontario. A lot of my patients have, have been prescribed it, and I'm sure you guys know uh, people who have been prescribed it as well. Um, and uh, there's a few things that we need to know about Paxlovid and, and how to access it and who's eligible. So the bottom line is, um, those who are eligible include anyone who has an immune compromising condition, meaning you're on immune compromising medications, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have colitis, you have any, any reason to be on uh, an immunosuppressing medication. Um, if you're receiving active treatment for, for, for cancer, um, if you're 70 years of age or over and you have COVID, automatically you're eligible for Paxlovid. If you're 60 years of age and over with less than three vaccine doses, so if you're you know if you're 62 and you only had two doses of, of the COVID vaccine, you didn't get that booster, you're eligible for Paxlovid. Um, or if you're 18 years of age or older with fewer than three vaccine doses, so again didn't get the booster, and uh, a high risk health condition. So those high risk health conditions include diabetes, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure. Uh, lung disease, um, cerebral palsy, developmental delay, um, moderate, uh, uh, moderate liver disease, those kind of things. So again, if you're 70, so if, you're, if, you, if you have COVID and, and you're immunocompromised, eligible for, for, for Paxlovid. If you're, if you're 70, year, 70 years of age or over, even if you've had all your booster doses, you're eligible for Paxlovid. If you're 60 years of age or over, but you've had fewer than three uh, vaccine doses, you're eligible for Paxlovid. And if you're 18 years of age or over with fewer than three vaccine doses with one high-risk medical condition, you're also eligible. So the question I've been getting from patients is, well, why aren't I eligible? I, I went through all of the, the rigmarole of getting my vaccines, and now you're telling me I, I can't get this antiviral because I've had my vaccine doses. And the rationale is that those who are highest risk for hospitalization are eligible for Paxlovid. So if, if you're not eligible for Paxlovid, that's a good thing because you're not considered to, to be high risk for hospitalization and um, the powers of B have, have decided that those who are lower risk for hospitalization um, are not eligible for what, what is a fairly expensive uh, medication. So again, just because you're not eligible, you're not getting inferior care, the fact you've had your, your vaccine doses and the fact uh, you may be younger, again, these are all good, you know, good things to, to reducing your, your risk of hospitalization. Okay. Um, for Paxlovid, you need to be within five days of symptoms to be eligible. So I've had patients reach out to me at day six of their illness, eligible for Paxlovid, telling me, oh, by the way, doc, I still have COVID symptoms. Uh, I had, uh, I, I developed a cough six days ago. Unfortunately, not eligible for Paxlovid once it's been over five days. So again, reach, if you're eligible, reach out to your primary care physician right away. Um, we can prescribe it. We can prescribe it at uh, community pharmacies now, so it's a lot easier to get. Um, but early, 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 because once you're with, once you're post five days, not even eligible. The other thing that's tricky around Paxlovid is there's a lot of medication interactions. So this is where again it is important to reach out to your primary care provider, your 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 doctor, or your nurse practitioner, around um, are there certain medications that we need to hold? 
are there ones that make you ineligible? I had a patient last week uh, who was not eligible for Paxlovid because of some medications that they were on. Um, so again, both your doc and the pharmacist will know what meds you're on and they can make those, uh, those changes. So uh, that's again, run Paxlovid. Uh, and again, exciting now between how many vaccines, uh, how effective vaccines have been and the effectiveness of Paxlovid in reducing hospitalization, we've got again, a, a number of arrows in our quiver um, to, to uh, continue to keep people out of hospital. Um, next topic uh, around masks. I, it's obviously some controversy in the last few months with mask mandates been been lifted and some patients have been asking me, you know, what do I do doc? Do I keep wearing my mask? Do I not keep wearing my mask? What, what do I do? But the bottom line is what I've been telling people is that if you're in a, in a public area, um, whether it's a store, whether you know grocery store, pharmacy, if you're at a London Knights or London Lightning game, if you're somewhere where there's a, a, a number of people for whom you don't know their their <laughs> their status and where they've been and and um, whether they're honest about their symptoms or not, if it's not an inconvenience for you to wear your mask, I'm usually recommending that people still wear their masks. I, I wear mine to the stores. I wear mine to the Knights game and the Lightning game. Um, my N95 mask. And I feel relatively uh, comfortable at, at those um, at those settings. When I go, you know, go to church, mask is on. Now, if you're if if it's a setting where you would consider it to be a burden, for instance, if you have people over your house and there's a small group of you guys, you probably don't need to wear masks at this point. Um, but again, if it's if you're somewhere where it's somewhere generally public and it's not an inconvenience to wear it, please, please, please consider wearing your mask. Um, a small aside in terms of you know how do we kind of transition away from needing some of the protocols i was somewhere recently where someone was wearing um kind of plastic gloves um in addition to wearing their mask and they were working somewhere um it, just a reminder that that surfaces are not a high risk uh transmission site for covid um and wearing gloves for covid prevention at this point probably isn't necessary um, again, if you see somebody wearing gloves, please don't shame them. You know, um, everyone is exposed to different information and they may not know that. But uh, again, if, if you've been, if you're still wearing gloves when you're out and about at the stores and whatnot, you, you, it's probably well overdue to ditch those. Uh, we can probably do without them. So that's our COVID update for today. Um, again, uh, the, the Paxlovid and the boosters are the most important things uh, to, to, getting, to getting through this. So again, if, if you know someone who's eligible for Paxlovid, make sure they hear this message because I'm still finding that a lot of people actually aren't even aware of, of Paxlovid, aren't aware of eligibility, um, because it's you know, it, it's not top of mind, right? You're not seeing news stories as much about COVID as you had before. Um, you're not seeing you know big things in the news, advertising, things like Paxlovid. So again, um, if someone in your life doesn't know about it, please, please share this message uh, so they're aware. And we'll be right back after this message uh, with some summer tips uh, for keeping you healthy. Welcome back. As we come into May, I thought it would be a good idea to review some topics uh, that we often see in healthcare coming into the summer uh, and how to keep us healthy and, and keeping out of us, us out of doctor's offices and emergency rooms. So there's a few topics that we want to go over today uh, that we thought you might find interesting. So first off um, is looking at summer as a bit of a time of renewal, I think is the first thing I want, want to address. Um, I think it's safe to say that over the last two years, and we've talked about this in some of the previous episodes about nutrition and exercise, um, but COVID has been a generally, uh, has had a negative effect on the lifestyle of many of you in terms of nutrition and exercise. Um, so if, if you haven't already, I think this would be a good time uh, to A, decide on a plan for physical activity over the next month, whether that's something on your own, something with friends, something family. Um, it's got to be something you enjoy doing and something that doesn't feel too onerous, but now is the best time to at least start that if you haven't already been doing something for the last uh, last couple of years. Weather's getting better, no excuse not to be outside more, even if it's just going for a walk. We know that's going to have a, a good effect on your mood, on your sleep, on your overall cardiovascular risk, your cancer risk, all of these things. So again, if you haven't been exercising, start now start start slow don't do too much we don't want to talk about injuries in our next episode but start something nice and easy um over the next kind of or the next month or so along the same lines nutrition if you're not already doing something in terms of tracking nutrition um 
not necessarily not, not necessarily a diet. We, you know, we've talked about nutrition and, and approached that in previous episodes, uh, but just being aware of what you're eating, taking some different approach uh, in terms of holding yourself accountable for what we're eating. Again, now with the weather being better is, is going to be the, the best time to do that because we're all feeling a little bit uplifted, uh, a little more motivated. This is going to be a good time. Um, and then the, the third thing um, is around alcohol. Um, Another topic where during COVID, alcohol consumption generally has gone up. I've seen this in my own practice. Um, summer generally isn't the best time for most people to kind of cut back on their alcohol intake. But again, I would argue that given what's what, what we've seen over the last uh, couple of years, um, making sure that you're mindful of what your alcohol intake this summer is going to be really important to make sure things don't escalate. Okay, so just three little things in terms of physical health um, to, uh, to, to start working on if you haven't already been doing that. So, um, so since summer health, uh, let's talk about a few things. Talk about sunscreen first. I get questions about, uh, about this a lot. Chemical sunscreens versus physical sunscreens. Which one's better? Which one do we, do we, do, do we care? Uh, care to use? So bottom line is they're both effective. Physical sunscreen are ones like titanium oxide or zinc oxide. Uh, you'll see people who have physical sunscreens. Uh, it's often, very, you know, you'll see a lot of kind of white cream on them. It's very obvious they have it on. That's a physical sunscreen. That works by essentially just reflecting the sun's rays off of you. Chemical sunscreens are, are different. Um, things like oxybenzone, you'll see ingredients like this. They take the light and they basically convert it uh, in, in, into a different form of energy. And that's how it prevents, uh, prevents you from, from burns and, and the effects of uh, UV, UVB uh, rays. Which one's better? They're both effective. Uh, physical sunscreens are, are far more expensive. That's the one thing you'll notice. Um, there's some discussion around, could there be long-term health consequences to chemical sunscreens? It's not convincing data. It's not enough to be panic-inducing. I still use chemical sunscreens myself. If cost is not a barrier, go for the physical sunscreens because again, they're, they're, they're um, they're, le they're, they're likely more safe, safe like even a little bit safer than, than the chemical sunscreens. But for most of us, again, I use chemical sunscreens myself. I, I, I don't really worry about that. Um, so, and again, I don't like the effect. The, I don't like the look of the, the zinc sunscreen. You know, call me call me vain, but I don't like the, the, the cast for the ghost. But everyone, to each his own. As long as you're wearing some kind of sunscreen, that's what's important. You need to be reapplying it every two hours. So don't just put on sunscreen once and then you're good for the for the uh, the whole day. You have to be reapplying every two hours. Usually the equivalent of a shot glass to cover your body for most average sized people. Um, try to avoid being out in the sun during peak uh, peak times. Uh, SPF has to be at minimum 30. So if it's less than 30, it's useless. Uh, you don't need super high SPFs, but minimum 30 is going to be important. Uh, and again, don't be fooled by clouds, right? Uh, in the summertime, if it's a cloudy day, UV rays are still uh, getting through that those clouds, so you can still get a sunburn even on those days. Okay. Uh, secondly, let's talk about uh, ticks. This is something that people often ask about. Uh, should I be worried about ticks? So, first thing to to determine when you're bitten by a tick is what kind of tick is it? Is it a deer tick or a dog tick? I'm going to show some images up on the screen right now. The difference between them. Uh, you can also look this up on your own, but basically dog ticks do not transmit Lyme disease. Deer ticks can, not always, but can. So if someone comes into my office uh, and, and the common thing I hear is, doc, I found a tick on me, uh, what do I do? First question I ask them is how long was that tick on them for? If it was possible that, that tick was on them for more than 24 hours and it's a deer tick, we actually your doctor will actually prescribe you uh, one dose of doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, to prevent Lyme disease. Okay. If it, there was no chance it was on there for more than 24 hours, you don't need antibiotics. Or if you're sure it was a dog tick, also no need for antibiotics. If someone has, has a history of a, of a tick and they're wondering about that target lesion that sometimes you can see after, after a tick bite, don't hesitate to reach out to your doc and they'll look, at, they'll look after things. But if, again, there's no history of that target lesion, and either it's less than 24 hours or it was a dog tick, you don't need antibiotics, okay? Um, there's something called a lone, you know, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to prevent tick, tick bites in general. Uh, there's something called a lone star tick, um, which uh, hasn't really come to Ontario too much, um, but in Southern states particularly, um, it can actually uh, cause a, a reaction which can result in a beef allergy, which as someone who enjoys beef is a horrifying thing to even think about. So. Um, how do we prevent ticks? 
tick bites and, and tick exposure when you're out for any prolonged period of time, doing a tick check when you come back, um, checking all your crevices to make sure that uh, uh, ticks haven't gotten anywhere on you, checking your pets for ticks, and wearing long, long sleeves or pants when you're out will also prevent that. Um, another issue this summer uh, is around small cuts. People will get small cuts if they're out doing, doing yard work or whatnot. A um, couple things to be aware of. Number one, uh, don't just put polysporin or fusin or topical antibiotics on cuts just because you're worried about an infection. That will actually probably make things worse. So um, just running it under copious, copious amounts of water is generally sufficient as an antiseptic initially. Um, getting any foreign debris out as well out of any cuts is going to be important. Um, don't put hydrogen peroxide on any, on any wounds, please, please, please. People still do this. I have no idea where this came from, uh, but it but it ruins wounds and makes it much, much more difficult to heal. Um, and again, if if a cut basically has a flap and you and there's something that you think needs to be sutured together, call your doctor. Uh, if if there's no evidence of any kind of opening in the skin. Uh, where there's no kind of flaps that need to be brought together. If it doesn't look red around it, generally again, just soap and water uh, and then and, and uh, monitor it. Don't scrub it too aggressively, just kind of keep it under, um, un, un, under tap water and that should be good enough. Uh, if you're out gardening, make sure you're wearing long sleeves. We see a lot of what we call plant dermatitis. So reactions to poison, poison ivy, poison oak, these kind of things. Um, again, protecting yourself when you're in the bush, when you're gardening to make sure you don't get um, exposed to it. If you get exposed to it, do not scratch it because what happens is you get the resin underneath your fingernails when you do this, and then you scratch over here, and now you've actually made the situation a lot worse. Reach out to your doc if you have a rash that's that's uh, concerning, that's itchy. We can give steroid creams, which help quite a bit. Um, so that's uh, around uh, plant dermatitis. Trampolines, bikes, fireworks, things that bring people to emerge. So trampolines. Uh, I've already had two patients end up with, with fractures. It's only May. I've already had two patients with fractures due to trampolines. There's virtually no setting under which trampolines are safe uh, for kids. Uh, I know they're fun. Um, every kid loves them, but they cause broken bones every single year. So please just be, be cognizant. Uh, fireworks, there's no reason to be near fireworks. Hold them in your hands. This causes eye injuries, burns every single year. Every emerge doc will tell you, stay well away from fireworks. And bike accidents, if you are riding a bike, uh, or any fast moving uh, mode of transportation, scooter, bike, rollerblading, anything like that, pop a helmet on. You only have one brain. It has to last you a lifetime. We do not want you injuring that brain. And a tip specifically for my patients with uh, diabetes, um, making sure that we're not going barefoot virtually anywhere, but especially uh, areas where you may step on things and not feel them. We know patients with diabetes sometimes will have deeper sensation. Uh, and will not heal as well. So there's no, really no excuse for patients with diabetes to go in barefoot anywhere. It's a really good rule of thumb for most of us. If you're anywhere where you could be stepping somewhere where you could be getting a cut or some kind of um, some kind of laceration, uh, it is important to try to you know, keep, keep those feet covered. First aid kits is the last thing I want to talk about uh, around summer safety tips. Making sure that you have a first aid kit anywhere um, that you think you may be coming into. So again, on a boat, at the cottage, in the car, anywhere where you're going to be, where someone might get injured. Again, you never know if you're out um, at a kid's, kid's sports event, anywhere, side of the road, someone could be needing, needing first aid. And the more of these kits we have out there, uh, the better. And you don't need a big fancy kit. Uh, something simple with some of the basics, whether it be gauze, um, band-aids. Um, again, simple first aid kit will be good, and you get those at any any uh, major box store. So, again, an important uh, summer su summer safety tip uh, to keep your family and, and yourselves healthy this summer. Hopefully, you found some of this advice helpful, and uh, some of the COVID tips. Again, making sure that you're sharing those COVID tips with those in your life uh, who are eligible for Paxlovid, who need their booster doses. We need to make sure that we're still staying safe with COVID, even though it's a bit out of the news. Um, so that we can have a safe rest of the summer uh, into the early fall. We'll talk to you next time and stay safe.